Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. Couple of announcements before I start today's Q&A session. Uh, one not so good, the show in London that Paul Thorpe has been talking about, has invited me to, where I was going to get a chance to meet a lot of my European viewers and London viewers. Unfortunately, has been not canceled, but postponed. Um, I'm gonna link the video below. I've already put it on my YouTube story, I guess it is now. Uh, a link to Paul's video, you guys can check that out. They're saying roughly a time level of about 12 weeks. Hopefully my travel schedule will allow for me to be there once the show goes on because I was looking forward to coming to London and meeting some of you guys. You guys have been communicating that to me via, uh, via my email as well as uh, <clears throat> some of the comments on YouTube. So yes, it's sad that it's been postponed. I agree with the cancellation of the show due to what's going on with the coronavirus, but I'm personally thinking that they should all blow over soon and hopefully we can get back to our normal lives. With that said, one more announcement, and I hate to do this to you guys. I've told you guys in the past couple of videos that I am uh, asking you to send your questions, requests, or whatever else it might be to an email address, roman at luxurybazaar.com. I changed that up a little bit this week because we've become overwhelming just the same. Roman at luxurybazaar.com is my normal work email where I get all the internal emails from the company as well as outside emails. So I created a new email address and I called it Roman Sharp at luxurybazaar.com. Not a big change, just Roman. I guess I'd have to go from here here. Just Roman Sharp at luxurybazaar.com. Please send all those emails there. On top of that, to keep up with all your questions, comments, requests, et cetera, et cetera, I actually took on an assistant to help me with this. Why? Because I care. Because this channel has grown tremendously over the last couple of years. I love my followers. I love my YouTube channel. I'm going to continue doing this. And I don't want to be the guy to say, you know what? I am no longer going to acknowledge comments. I'm no longer going to acknowledge emails and things of that nature. I'm going to try to keep up with it for as long as I can. And if I have to hire another assistant to do so, then that's what I'm going to do. In either case, let's go to some questions again. Now, most of these are going to be via email. So let's see. First one is actually not a question, but an idea that I got from a gentleman by the name of Alvaro. He says, good afternoon, Roman. Thanks for your attention to emails. It really helps a lot. Today, I'm writing this email because I have a question regarding your company, Luxury Bazaar. I've been scrolling through your site and noticed some nice prices. But my question is that if you have any coupons for your subscribers, maybe an extra 2 to 3% off. Because I've noticed that in other channels, this happens. And I wanted to ask you, this because it might encourage other people as well to buy more watches from you. Would this be possible? If so, it would help me a lot. I'm looking for a new watch to put in my collection. Thanks again for your time. Love the videos. Keep it up, man. Well, uh, thank you for that, first and foremost. Um, when I started this channel and as I continue growing this channel, I told you guys I didn't create this channel in order to generate sales. But yet, I was honest with you and said that it did. It has and it's been doing so on a regular basis and it's literally like this. Um, one of the things we pride ourselves here at LB, or at least I pride myself in, is from the very beginning, when it was just me and a couple other guys, I set a system in place where I track everything that happens within the company. I've always said, don't set goals, results of which you cannot measure, right? And that goes across any type of marketing, any type of advertising, uh, sales, uh, logistics, anything and everything that goes on in my company to include content and to include, obviously, making YouTube videos. So where the purpose of this YouTube channel was to get on, tell you guys how it is, create a closer community to me and my company, ultimately it resulted in direct sales. A lot of you guys that are watching this have already bought a watch or two from me, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Those that have already bought also know that this is a very personal business, meaning that you're gonna be emailing back and forth with one of the sales representatives and my sales team. You can get on the phone and talk to us. There's a lot of personal attention that goes into purchasing a watch. Why? Because these are not cheap items, right? These are fairly expensive items. And for anybody buying expensive items, you wanna to talk to a human, you wanna be able to correspond via email, WhatsApp, or whatever is more comfortable for you. So therefore, it's a very personalized business. And guess what happens when a YouTube fan calls into this office? you do get a better price automatically. And my salespeople know that. Uh, I pride myself on hooking up my YouTube followers. And I don't think I'm gonna go the route of creating coupon codes and things like that because all it is is just another marketing technique, right? We utilize those marketing techniques across our website with coupons and discount codes and email marketing, things of that nature, but this is not what my YouTube channel is for. The only thing I'll tell you guys, if you are looking for a particular watch, email that email address that I said before, RomanSharp at luxurybazaar.com. 
Most likely I will forward that on to my sales team or my assistant, Devin. They'll help you out immediately. And you will get, as, a, as we call it in Philly, a hookup. And that's just it. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to throw that out there. And I, and I hope I don't get too much heat as if I'm making this episode to sell watches. Let's talk questions, right? Well, it's really not a question. It's another challenge. And this challenge comes from a gentleman by the name of Kyle. This is a good one. <laughs> I actually read this one before. The last challenge that I did about picking watches within 10,000, I didn't read the question. I actually did it on the fly. This one I had to read twice over because I really had to think about this one because these are some pretty odd questions. But I hope you guys find this entertaining. So here's another challenge. Uh, challenge number one. Would you rather A, become a widely publicized brand ambassador for Invicta? You're contractually obligated to wear only Invicta timepieces for a period of three years and you receive no compensation for your services. Wearing non-Invicta watch or even hinting something negative about Invicta during the three-year contract will cause you to fracture a random bone. Oy. B, your wrist circumference for both wrists permanently shrinks by two inches. This cannot be physically fixed in any way, exercise, weight gain, etc. Gee, I, Ian, can you see what would happen if my wrist shrunk another two inches? Thank you, Ian, and thank you to the power of uh, video editing. Whoa, that's a tough one. Uh, well, I gotta tell you, I'm not a big fan of Invicta, I should say. I don't knock Invicta because they do extremely well. You sell them selling everywhere and making thousand different watches a day, per se. But I'm not so sure about shrinking my uh, wrists by two inches because that would virtually leave me no wrist. I don't have such a big wrist to begin with and shrinking these two more inches, I just, I don't see myself doing So I guess I would have to go with being a brand ambassador for Invicta. But I will tell you, most likely I will have a random bone fracture because there's no way I would not make a negative comment in three years about that particular brand. Challenge number two, would you rather A, work collaboratively with AP to design and release a limited run of 25 Roman Sharp offshores and you are given watch number one of 25, but do not make any money from the project otherwise. Or B, the crystal ball Ian gave you miraculously becomes omniscient. The crystal ball will answer just two yes or no questions accurately before disappearing forever. Well, I wonder what a limited edition Roman Sharp offshore would look like. That would be really, really cool, but I gotta be honest with you, having my crystal ball that Ian gave me become omniscient and giving me two yes or no questions accurately before disappearing forever, I'm gonna go ahead and go with that because I'm fairly certain that with those two questions, I could make enough money to buy Audemars Piguet. So if there were to be for sale. So I'm gonna go with B. I'm gonna take my crystal ball and make it a genie that it can answer two yes or no questions. It is a little bit tricky because yes or no questions, I can't actually ask them, hey, uh, what's the lottery numbers tomorrow? But I can certainly come up with a couple of yes or no questions in regards to the stock market and make a killing that way. So B, crystal ball will become the genie. Ian? Thank you. Um, and number three, would you rather be gifted a Blue Dials Paddock Skymoon Terbion must keep, cannot sell, or B, gain a special set of watch sales abilities? Set any watch just by looking at the dial. Buyers only offer you their highest price. Sellers only offer you their lowest price. Fake watches that you encounter make a siren noise, and custom forms are completely automated. Honestly, just by the last statement of customs forms being fully automatic, that's, I'm already going with B because that's such a pain in the neck to do. To be able to set a watch this by simply looking at it would be pretty magical. I would certainly go with that. If I buyers offer me only their highest price and sellers only offering their lowest price, I would be selling a lot more, therefore making a lot more watches, and I would most likely be able to buy a Sky Monterbium for both of my wrists. So, interesting challenge, definitely something out of left field. Uh, may not be realistic, but nevertheless, very entertaining. So, Kyla, thank you for that. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm gonna have Ian throw those A and B choices up on the board and uh, have you guys comment below which you would choose, A or B, in the three challenges. Now, let's get to some actual watch questions. This one comes from RC Watches. Uh, hi, Roma, I have a question for you. Do you prefer a brand with an in-house movements but less originality in design and not much creativity, or a brand with a lot more originality and creativity but with an ETA, Miyota, et cetera, movements? By the way, I love your content. Thank you for giving so much knowledge for free to YouTube videos. You were one of the reasons I started an IG page about watches. So let's give this guy a shout out. I'm assuming you are Artsy Watches on Instagram. Artsy, A-R-T-Z-Y Watches. Okay, so guys. 
follow this guy's Instagram, help him out. This is not an easy question to answer. I told you guys before uh, how I go about watches, right? How I, I buy what I like first and foremost. I wear what I like first and foremost, regardless of price, right? But I, look, I also look for other factors. I look at certain iconic pieces, meaning certain lines or certain watches within a lineup of a brand that's been around forever. I look at the historical factors. History is extremely important to me. I look for those brands that have the longevity of being around for as long as they claim to be on their websites, right? Unlike some other brands that say they were established in 1695, like Graham, and then all of a sudden reappear 10 years later, right? You know, this is one of those things that I also look for. But for the most part, like a significant other, for example, the very first thing that brings you to another human being is being attracted to them, right? And I feel with watches, it's the same. The very first thing that I look for in a watch is that, hey, do I actually like this watch, right? I'm not gonna go out there and buy a Nautilus 5711 because it's the hypest watch on the market if I didn't like Nautilus. I happen to like the Nautilus because it was designed by Gerald Genta and it's an iconic timepiece, but just as an example, right? So if I look at a watch and I feel that the watch is super original, I think it's super cool, but yet it still has an Eta movement in it, it's not gonna stop me from buying the particular watch. I will tend to lean more towards originality and creativity in design because that's your first impression. So to answer your question, I am going to lean more towards the latter, which you said is originality and creativity within the design of the watch because first impressions you know, kind of go a long way. And uh, of course, I will look at movements. I will get geeky on a watch in terms of complications and things of that nature. So there are exceptions to the rule. If I'm gonna go for a super complicated watch, I want an in-house movement. I want somebody that created that perpetual candle emitter repeater or turbine or things of that nature. But for the most part, again, it's going to be the originality and creativity of a watch regardless of what's inside at a first glance. Hope that answers your question. Here's a good question from uh, Thomas, who brings up a topic that I don't think I've ever discussed. We discussed uh, watch accessories such as watch winders, but he's asking me a question about watch safes. And it's a good question. Uh, Hi Roman, I'm new to your channel, but I have watched a bunch of your videos already. Great content, thank you, and watch the rest of them. My watch collection is growing. I've been looking for advice on how to best store your watches safely. Bank safes seem impractical and useless. I've been looking for reviews on personal watch safes, but they are hard to come by. Maybe an episode on that. I have a very easy suggestion for you, and that is not to look for a valuable safe, but to look for a gun safe. And the reason I say that is because I happen to have experience. In my house, I have a bunch of gun safes. Why? Two reasons. Number one, I'm into guns. <laughs> I shoot guns on a weekly basis. It's a hobby of mine. It's been a hobby of mine since I left the US military. It's something that I'm into and it's a safe place to store guns, right? But at the same token, they're extremely fireproof. And that's exactly what you want because if, you know, a gun safe, if it goes ablaze, you don't want the ammunition that's stored in there for say to start blowing up, right? So that makes it a very durable safe and most of them actually UL rated so they're hard to break into. Uh, if you're looking to store watches at home, my suggestion is again, go out there and buy a gun safe. A lot of these fancier safes that you see out there for your values, they tend to be overpriced. The safe that you guys often see the door open to, to my right, that's actually a gun safe. That's not a safe where we keep our watches. We have a vault in the building, right? Again, you don't have to go that big. They come as small as the size of a picture frame. There are safes that fit, that slide under your bed. There are safes that go into walls. There are hidden safes and shelves. There's all kinds of cool stuff out there. And in reality, what are you trying to prevent? You're trying to prevent a burglar coming into your house, hopefully while you're not at home, and robbing you of your valuables, right? But in the case where you are home, uh, unless your safe is really, really hidden, or if you're under distress and somebody's pointing a gun to your head and says, hey, go open up the safe, my recommendations is have insurance because no watch and no valuable out there is worth risking anyone's life. Insurance number one, and if you're going to go with a safe in your house, I would suggest numerous gun safes that are out there that are, again, inexpensive, that can be easily hidden in plain sight without people even knowing that there's a safe behind there so that odds are the burglar won't even find your stuff. Of course, if, you're gonna, if you wanna go the fancy route, sky's the limit. There are companies out there that make valuable safes that, uh, you know, are plated with 24 karat gold and uh, that have uh, winders inside the safes and things of that nature. They get up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't recommend those just as much as I don't recommend watch winders. It's just an unnecessary accessories. But if you have the money to splurge and you want something to look great and serve a great purpose as far as storing your watches, by all means, get out there and spend that money. Other than that, for a thousand bucks, get a nice gun safe, put your stuff in there, get one that's hidden so it's out of sight, out of mind, so to speak, and go from there. Hope that answers your question. Here's a good one from Gregoria E from Costa Rica. Hey Roman, next time avoid Aruba and come to Costa Rica. I actually replied to him and there was some confusion where I may have 
mistype and said, Puerto Rico, I have been to Costa Rica and I've had a wonderful time in Costa Rica. I rented a couple of Jeeps. I explored the forest. I've uh, been to a bunch of your wild beaches were pretty hard to get to uh, and almost flipped my Jeep over a couple of times. But uh, I have been to Costa Rica. It is indeed a beautiful island. And for those of you guys that like to explore nature, I think the only other place I can think of that has as beautiful beaches as Costa Rica and at least wild beaches is probably Thailand. But Costa Rica was a blast. Your question is, what do you prefer and why? Tribian or Minute Repeater? Again, a hard question, it kind of depends. I'm gonna tell you my favorite, and that's going to be the Turbion. And the reason for that is because I'm a big fan of Louis Breguet, who invented the Turbion a long time ago, right? At the same token, there could be arguments to this. Well, the Minute Repeater is, is a bigger complication than the Turbion. In general, yes, it is. With the Minute Repeater repeating the time on your watch on demand as you're sitting there is pretty damn impressive. So. Yes, it's a bigger complication than that of a Turbion. Oftentimes it comes in a combination, but if it was just a separate thing, I would go with the Turbion for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. I talked to you guys many times about the show off factor, right? When you're wearing a Turbion, for those that know, know. That little window, which is usually at six o'clock, which is the Turbion, for those that know, they know you have a Turbion on the wrist. Not many people may recognize that. For those that know, know, and that gives you that show off factor, right? You know, I'd like to be a show off. I told you guys, outside of vintage watches, I wear diamond pieces, I wear expensive pieces, so I do like to show off and I like the wow factor. I'm not a shallow person, you know, I would never throw this into anybody's face, but I still have a little bit of that in me. So that's one of the reasons where with the minute repeater, the levers on the side of the watch, as you're wearing the watch, it seemingly looks like just a regular watch. Now let's get it comboed with a Turbion or some other fancy complication, let's say of a perpetual calendar. So the show off factor is not there in the minute repeater. I am very, very much fascinated by the minute repeater complication, especially when you get some of the greater minute repeaters, the ones that have the petite sonnery and the grand sonnery. And by the way, guys, I'm throwing all these terminology out there. I did a couple episodes on minute repeaters. You guys can go back and check them out. That talks about the difference of minute repeaters and things of that nature. Ian, maybe link it up there. No show off factor with the minute repeater. And let's talk about how useful a minute repeater functionality is. I don't know if anybody out there uh, rather than glancing at their watch, will set the minute repeater off to here. So unless you're in the movies and it's completely dark and you wanna know what time it is, which you're not gonna do in the middle of a movie theater because the thing chimes pretty loudly, right? Shut, shut, drunk! We're trying to watch the movie! And if I have to tell you again, we're gonna take it outside and I'm gonna show you what it's like! You understand me? And if you think I'm kidding, just try me. So the only useful functionality of a minute repeater that I can see is again, when it's dark and you wanna know what time it is, you can't read your watch. Uh, let's say you forget your glasses. Yes, it's very, very useful. Uh, if the watch is sitting on a nightstand and in the middle of the night you want to know what time it is, you set that off. Of course, my wife would probably be upset at me for waking her up. So from a usability perspective, not very useful on the minute repeater. And again, you can just glance at your watch and see what time it is unless, again, you're in a situation where you either can't see the watch or it's too dark. But then at the same token, I can argue the same thing about a Turbion. I told you guys before, the Turbion was originally made for a pocket watch. So a Turbion only works when it's perpendicular to the ground, when your watch is this way. When the watch is this way, it doesn't really do anything. So if I were to go with a Turbion, I would go one of those 3D Turbions, right? That spin around three axes that works all the time. And that would make it useful because your watch would be a lot more accurate than an average watch because the Turbion will adjust the mainspring for the effect that gravity had on the movement within one minute's time, right? So that's my answer. I'm going to go with the Turbion over the minute repeater personally, but you guys be the judge and based on what I said. And comment below, uh, let me know what you would go with, the minute repeater or Turbion. Gonna go back to one of my very old viewers, EJ Trinidad, whose questions I've answered before in the past. He always comes up with good questions, and uh, here we go. Roman, you hope you've been well. Glad to see the rapid growth of your channel. Thank you, EJ. Uh, well deserved, congrats, keep it up. A few questions, number one, in your opinion, what is the best diver on the market today, and why? What do you think of the Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms? Well, I'm biased. I'm gonna tell you I like the AP Diver Automatic, but at the same token, I would have to give kudos back to Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms due to the history of them being a diving watch going back to the 50s, and you guys have seen, I have one. I have a Blanc Pond Aqualung going back to the 50s and the 60s when they were producing these watches for divers. I would also give credit to Panerai. Panerai has a lot of history with diver watches, right? They made diving watches for the Italian military going back about 70 years at this point, right? In terms of a workhorse, in terms of reliability, in terms of actually using this watch as a diving watch, I would go with the Blanc Pond. I would go with the Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms. You know that big monster one that they came out with that has all the functionality that a diver needs? I would go with that one. If you're specifically doing this for diving and you want a fancy diving watch outside of going to one of those electronic devices, I would certainly go with the Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms. 
Uh, two, speaking of divers, which AP diver is your favorite and why? I wish I read the whole question before I answered it. Is there anything special about the wimpy ones? Remember when I did the episode when I talked about sort of those models that give the breakthrough to the other ones? They're sort of like these test models, right? Well, that's what the wimpies were. You know, the wimpies came out way before any of the other diver watches. It was AP's way to introduce the sort of in between because all the offshores were chronographs, right? I mean, granted, some of the older, smaller ones were some power reserves and so on and so forth. For the most part, offshores were chronographs. And to make another offshore in the lineup of the offshore line, but yet not another chronograph, they sort of tested the waters with the Wimpy pieces. By doing so, it opened up to the diver line where AP saw that hey, the public took well. The price is sort of that in-between, right? Between those Royal Oaks at the time. Well, Royal Oaks are crazy now, but you know what I mean. Between that, those plain Jane Royal Oaks and the offshore chronographs, they sort of stuck that retail in between at about 19000 I think, with the first steel diver. And Wempy sort of paved the way. So to me, you know, in the future, that's going to become one of those iconic pieces uh, because it was the Wempy divers that paved the road for the divers we see today. For the diver chronographs that we have now, it really allowed the diver uh, line to sort of take off with AP, and they're still doing well. Uh, number three, are there any time and date only RMs, like 10 or 29, with base plates of the 002 and 003? Maybe some special boutique releases or something. I don't know of any. Uh, uh, I know that the base plates in O2s and O3s, the regular turbine and the GMT turbine, uh, are in those watches. Uh, I may be wrong. For those of you guys that can think of an RM that has that base plate, let me know. And the reason I think they don't exist, and this is without me doing any research just off the top of my head, is because you have to consider when the RM10 and RM29 came out versus the 0203. The 02s and 3s were some of the first RMs where, uh, alongside with the 005, which was the plain Jane watch, right? And only at a much later time, they came out with the 10s and later with the 29. EJ? Thanks again for asking great questions, and I hope I gave you some decent answers. I'm going to do one more and get at it. This is a really good one from Amini. Hey, Roman. Amini here from Popular 8. I'm a big fan of the channel after discovering it last year, and I have a quick question for Q&A Tuesday. It's been one year since the controversial launch of AP Code 1159, and I'd love to know what the market is telling you about the value of this line. Is there demand? Has the value fallen as many pundits suggested. How do you think history will remember this line? Love your videos, bro. And a big shout out to Ryan the Lion. Uh, I was just with Ryan the Lion in Dubai, actually, uh, when I did the Middle East trip due to the fact that the Hong Kong show was canceled and uh, we had a good time. So the controversial cold 1159. I never looked at it as controversial. I just looked at it as a line that everybody just jumped on a bandwagon and started making fun of as soon as a few key bloggers or vloggers decided to talk shit about the line. I like the 1159 line. When I did the review of SIHH last year and I talked about the code 1159, I felt it was a brush of fresh air. I like the design. I like the fact that it's it was sort of like in between the Royal Oak design and the Jules design, like dressy, sporty. I love the line. Uh, you want to know how it's doing? Let's see. And I'm going into my books, so... Sales by item summary. Well, I can tell you this. In the last quarter alone, we sold two perpetual calendars. We sold one chronograph rose gold blue. We sold one chronograph rose gold black. And we sold two plain Janes, uh, code 1159s. Uh, the perpetual calendar retails for 86000 and we sold it for 76000 a piece. Why? Because they're not available. And people still want them. Why? Because they're popular because it's a hell of a looking watch. The best part about the Perpetual is the sort of the star dial, I guess, yeah, the best way I can describe it, right? The Plain Jane watches sold at a slightly, a, a slightly bigger discount at about 20 off, uh, uh, as well as the chronographs. A couple of sold at like 18 off, a couple of sold at 20 off, which means I'm buying the stuff at about 24% off. So some of the regular Plain Jane models, as well as the chronograph, Mark, our cost is pretty high on them still because A, they didn't make very many of it. It was rumored that AP said they were gonna make a total of 1,500 pieces. That's not a lot. Considering the popularity of the brand, considering how many people in the world buying watches, it's not a lot of watches, and that's why they're holding their value. Now, if somebody brought me a used one today, again, again, maybe not a fair example, considering what's going on in the world with this whole corona nonsense. If somebody brought me one today, if I just paid 25 off for a new one and sold it for 20 off, let's say, right, most likely I'm going to want to pay them about 40 off for a pre-owned one, which means they're, again, going to hold their value pretty decent. The Perpetuals, I would probably pay close to what the person paid because they're super scarce. You can't find the Perpetuals and they're holding value and they're holding value well. So there's your answer about the Code 1159. All the shit talkers that were talking crap about this watch when it first came out, guess what? It's a good line. It's a great addition to the AP lineup. Something different outside the octagon. Hmm, that's good. Get it? Roll up. 
See what I did there? Anyway, so yeah, code 1159 is just fine. If you're still looking to go out there and buy one, you will get a slight discount on one and uh, buy it, enjoy it, nice watches. So can't say anymore. Guys, I'm sure this episode ran pretty long today with all the announcements and everything else. I apologize in advance. Plus I'm, I'm also getting a ton of questions from you guys. So I try to cram in as many as I can. I hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button, hit the share button. That's what helps my channel grow when you guys share the stuff on your Facebooks and Instagrams and etc. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you're not a subscriber and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.